Hello, uh, welcome to Cafe Realist, another day, another opportunity for me to have a bit more of a meaningful interaction with someone I cross paths with on Twitter regularly, but never really interacted. Kevin, could you introduce yourself to the, the listeners and viewers of uh, Cafe Realist? Sure, I'm Kevin Lemke, known as Kevin Lovecraft or Kefuhu out on Twitter, or if you're back on the good old Google+, Plus, I was very active out there in several communities, including RPGs. And I'm a member of Misdirected Mark, and also a proud patron of The Gauntlet. Cool. Uh, what was I about to say? Uh, and it's another day when uh, I am a bit confused. <laughs> Uh, we all are these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I really can't complain. I'm uh, this few people are got more white privilege than I do. But uh, yeah, so I guess uh, it's a good time to make uh, to repeat what I said in the last episode. If you're a Nazi, you can fuck off right now. <laughs> uh, Black Lives Matter, and uh, yeah. Fuck you, Nazi. Fuck you, racist. Uh, that said, uh, that's the only second episode when we had actual uh, profanity, but uh, uh, it's really worth it uh, to be clear yes. about that. 100%. So on that, uh, my ice breaking question for this show is, what's your routine like at the moment? Oh, my routine's so weird. I've been into the office, I think this is my third time to be physically on site since March 7th or so. Uh, quarantine or stay at home orders went into place when I was out visiting a friend in Portland, Oregon. And so when I was flying out, the airport was empty. I, when I came back, the Portland airport, there was no security line, none. Not even one person ahead of me. I've never experienced anything like that in business or personal travel before. Uh, and then I connected through Salt Lake City, which was bonkers. That airport was overflowing. You couldn't stand six feet away from anyone. Uh, that's back before uh, people were told that they should be wearing masks. So uh, we had people who got deplaned because someone was ill. You should have seen the people look at each other on the aircraft. Everyone's like, oh, are we going to die? Uh, I think it was food poisoning, but everyone was very scared. And uh, then I got home at like, what, one in the morning back into Minneapolis. And I live about <clears throat> 45 minutes west of Minneapolis out in a rural setting. So I got home about two in the morning and I've been into work twice. <laughs> well, my third time since. So most of my work is done from home. You know, I start around seven in the morning work until about 4 p.m. local. Uh, I actually find I'm working more because you don't have that separation and the commute time to break things up. And it's like, you remember something, you just your office is <laughs> right downstairs instead of being 45 minutes away. So been working more, uh, trying to control my media consumption because to a certain extent, other than being outraged and angry, you know, there's not a lot of value in a lot of uh, what's being fed to us, I, in my opinion, from, you know, sources like New York Times and Washington Post. Uh, and so what I've been trying to do is to be better about following people who provide actions that you can take to try to make a difference. And I have several friends who are very good about that, uh, like Eli Kurtz is, uh, a true shining light. That guy is so positive uh, and, you know, doing positive things instead of just being pissed off. So really appreciate having people like that in my life. Uh, and then the other thing I've been doing for fun, I, I've been able to start reading again. It was really hard for a while. Uh, I read a ton, mostly in horror. I haven't really been doing any gaming because it just feels wrong. <laughs> uh, to be pretending to have people with problems when there's real people with real problems. I just can't get that cognitive dissonance uh, to be overcome. And uh, But 
on Saturday nights, uh, my Monster Hearts group, rather than gaming, uh, we've been watching movies together, uh, either with Netflix party or just uh, we rent the movies online and just tweet about them. We use this hashtag called Horse House to inside joke from one of our Slack channels. Um, and we call it Horse House Cinema. And we watch, you know, both good and horrible movies and just tweet about them and make fun and have a good time with each other. And that's been a real lifeline uh, for me having that. So that's what I've been kind of doing. So most of my work days are just work days. Then I read in the evenings and then watch a movie a week on Saturday nights. Uh, I have really poor internet out in the country. I'm using cellular, da cellular data, so I, I can't do like a lot of Netflix and stuff like that. Otherwise, I'll use up my data plan. Wow. <laughs> so would you say that reading is sort of the, that's my second ice-breaking question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, the, a hobby or a skill that you would have picked up recently? Uh, no, I've been a, well... I mean, I'm not saying you reader. learned to read recently. But. Yeah, I, no, I've been a big reader since about fifth grade. I remember uh, when I stumbled across, uh, I'm not sure which came first. It was either a Hardy Boys mystery or Alfred Hitchcock's Three Investigators mystery. Uh when I was in elementary school down in Lamar, Missouri. And those were the first books that just really grabbed me. And ever, I'd always been a nerd uh, into Star Trek and all that stuff since I was a little kid. Uh, and when I started reading those mysteries, and then that's when I segued into Pratchett and Lord of the Rings. I remember my parents gave me a box set of uh, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit in like 1975 or 76. Uh, that was my big Christmas gift and uh, never looked back. Um, and so I mostly read, uh, I read a ton of horror right now is my focus. I also read science fiction uh, and a bunch of subgenres in that. Um, and then I also really enjoy mysteries and I've been trying to be uh, part of my self-improvement thing has been reading more nonfiction. Uh, so right now I'm reading a book about the suffrage uh, movement uh, called Why We Marched. Uh, but I've been trying to read a lot of books about uh, Native American history, uh, African American history and stuff because I at least my generation when I was going through school, all that stuff just was literally whitewashed. It was, especially being down in Missouri, which was a slave state, never even got brought up when we went over state history when I was in fifth grade there. Well, I was brought up in Belgium, and believe me, uh, nothing ever got mentioned uh, uh, of mm. relevance regarding Leopold II and the colonies, uh, yep. yeah, absolutely nothing. I, I probably was, I don't know, twenty something when I finally saw a play discussing the subject. And uh, yeah, no, they, there's a movement in Belgium about removing statues of that king because uh, uh, beloved king uh, in Belgium, like all the kings in Belgium, we didn't have that many. It's not like France. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, I support that, but uh, I'm happy I'm not around in Belgium to hear people complain about that because it's such a weird environment, such a very heavily biased, if not plain racist, but not. It's a it's a very odd expression of racism. It's. Uh, uh, for lack of better words, kind of soft expression, but it's all over the place. Yeah. Uh, no one is, uh, no one considers themselves racist, but they pretty much all yes. are. <laughs> and everything I grew up with, uh, all the humor and, and so on, are, are totally unacceptable. And, and yeah, I had a big argument with uh, both my mother and my father were separated and yeah. don't agree on things about 
Zoarte Pete, uh, which is a literally black-faced figure uh, of uh, mm. culture, which is still uh, around every year as part of or equivalent of Santa Claus. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like it's it's very difficult the conversation is just not happening that's that's we don't have a racism issue because if we were discussing racism there would be that would mean there's an issue nobody is discussing it so there's no issue right like yeah right yeah brilliant um so <laughs> uh tolkien was that your introduction to medieval fantasy and by extension role-playing yeah. games or were you or was it the other way around Oh, it was the books first. Uh, I first started playing D and D. I was the first person that I know of in my little town. I grew up in a town called Glencoe, Minnesota. Its claim to fame uh, was they had the world's largest pea and corn processing plant that was owned by Green Giant at the time. So, agricultural community, some manufacturing, um, and so it was a town of under three thousand people. My graduating class was like 108 people there. Uh, and I was at a like uh, teacher's uh, education store and saw this box on a display with other educational games. And it had this cool dragon breathing fire down on, you know, this guy with a sword and a wizard with this pointy hat. And I'm like, Dungeons and Dragons, what's that? And I flip it over and I, oh my God, I can. I can play Lord of the Rings with this. And I picked that up. And the next week I got uh, the first edition of Advanced D&D and got a group of friends together that we all shared nerd books at school. And so from like, what, 78 or so through when we graduated in 81, we played just Dungeons and Dragons every week, um, pretty much. And uh, when Call of Cthulhu came out from Chaosium, I picked that up in its first edition. I don't remember what year that was, if it was 84, if it was before that. Uh, and that kind of honestly became my go-to game after that uh, because you don't have to worry about long campaigns because no one lives that long. <laughs> And this was long before I realized all the implicit racism that was built into Lovecraft's, uh, his own worldview and was often reflected in his fiction. I read and consumed that fiction and it just went over my head because we were never taught to think critically about those type of things uh, in school and to look at the sociological setting. Um, but the whole... So my, I'm a glass half empty, half full. I'm glass half full guy. Yeah, I'm a pessimist. And the whole uh, nihilism of the Cthulhu mythos uh, entropy, I'm like, if you're going to worship something really honestly, I don't believe there's necessarily anything besides entropy. And then what happens after entropy finishes when, in theory, there'll be another expansion. But... Uh, and I didn't realize that that's what that was articulating for me at that time with my very negative attitude because I had moved up from Missouri into Minnesota, got teased for having a southern accent, was an outcast for being a nerd. <laughs> and that really shaped how I've interacted with most of my life. I, you know, I could have been one of those gross gamer gate guys if I didn't have good friends who modeled good behavior uh, because of... Uh, how I felt, you know, excluded from so much stuff. Luckily, I had great people in college um, that I roomed with that were very different from me, came from bigger cities. Um, and I stopped playing for a while when I was in college because I tried finding a group uh, down at uh, Southwest Missouri State University and the people I met there just couldn't click with them. And then several years later, when I was working for a small uh, IT consulting firm, we had hired a guy on straight out of school. And it came up, uh, the conversation about this third edition of D&D was coming out. Maybe we should try it. And started playing D&D again and got back into Call of Cthulhu. And 
uh, Weird War and a bunch of other stuff and started playing a lot of board games and that again. And uh, been playing pretty solidly ever since then. That would have been Nineteen eighty, no, nineteen ninety four or so. So I had a gap of several years. I wasn't doing any role playing, but still reading heavily, and that. And I've transitioned over time from. I mean, I with uh, did an actual play podcast with uh, Misdirected Mark. That was D and D fifth edition, and. Of all the D&Ds, that's by far my favorite. But I tend to enjoy games that are much lighter on rules and definitely geared towards theater of the mind, uh, just especially like playing over the internet because that's the way a lot of my play works. Uh, makes it a lot easier. Monster Hearts is probably my absolute favorite game. Uh, and then there's this... Cthulhu Dark, uh, which is like the most stripped down essential version of Call of Cthulhu I've ever seen. And it pretty much gets rid of the whole sanity system because that can be problematic because in some ways it can trivialize mental illness. Um, I think that's a very important thing when you're playing those type of games with people is to talk about that and what those things mean and that they're not played for laughs. Um, so I tend to be more in the rules light uh, side of things, played a bunch of Monster of the Week with some friends. Uh, but that's where I'm at in gaming these days. I went from uber crunch weapon speed <laughs> to <laughs> different types uh, of what do you do spheres. now? <laughs> Well, uh, uh, rewinding a little, uh, little back, well, uh, 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 quite a bit back, uh, you mentioned that you, you just got bought the book and then you played with friends. And I find it so impressive because the way I was brought in the hobby was when I purchased, well, I, 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 I asked and I received as a gift for Christmas the second edition of West End Game Star Wars D6. Oh, but, uh, yeah, it, awesome. It probably took me two or three years before actually playing uh, and when I did it was because I found people who already played and then they co-opted me and, and even still today I realize uh, I set myself something saying I'm not gonna uh, pledge on the Kickstarter anymore until I play the demo of the game because I've realized that <laughs> I have big difficulties running a game before playing a game but yeah the idea that you got the books of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, I don't remember which edition you said it was. Maybe it was the first. Or the this second. first edition, AD and D, was the one that we really played. So you got yeah. you got you got those books of AD and D uh, in the late seventies or mid seventies, and so already they are not as legible maybe as some games today. You don't have the yeah. resources, you don't have the videos or the communities, the Google Plus, the the all of that to tell you how to run it. And yet you managed to do it with a bunch of friends. Was it pure drive or the fact you had more time? You were not like kid these days on TikTok? Or, or how did you manage to pull I, that off? I think it was, well, um, I don't want to sound like I'm too my horn, but I've always been thrust into leadership roles, which I'm not necessarily super excited about being in. Um, but... I'm not afraid to make decisions. And I was kind of like a leader in my little group of friends, probably because I'm the most outspoken. <laughs> and uh, we all like, we all like had loved uh, the Bashki Hobbit. And uh, then uh, who did the rotoscope versions of Lord of the Rings, uh, those movies. And um, it was an easy sell. And I think back then in some ways, onboarding to a hobby that you don't know anything about was a lot easier because you didn't have all these people out there like you know a Matthew Mercer and Critical Role with voice actors playing being incredible with these detailed minis and setups where it's very intimidating and you're like oh my god I might be doing it wrong I didn't know I was doing it wrong I found out later we were doing all sorts of things wrong but since we all onboarded at the same time it, it, it 
was in a way easier. And yeah, I definitely had way more time back then than a lot of kids do now. I mean, I was in sports and things like that, but it's nothing like it was with like my daughter was in advanced placement and she had so much schoolwork and she had to do uh, social service, volunteer work and membership and things. And kids just don't have that sort of leeway now, plus the whole distraction of electronic devices uh, and social media. So I think it was, in a way, it was kind of, while it's now the golden age of gaming, I think it was the golden age of easy onboarding back then in a way. Uh, and maybe it helped that I was in a small town so there wasn't anyone to go, oh, no, you can't join this club, kid, because I made the club. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I think there's a whole bunch of factors. It's quite f fascinating, I find, how... I keep wondering about younger players now. Uh, I think I think they they're certainly not worse than the uh, when I started. On the contrary, but I find it fascinating. Sometimes I, w I was I'm wondering how games are shaped by middle-aged people, and I, I find there's a, a whole range of games now. And it's not a criticism; it's just something uh, I find fascinating. The the games are oriented uh, toward more and more toward, uh, with the exception of Dungeons and Dragons towards easier onboarding in the design and less time requiring and even sometimes not build as much towards long campaigns and, and big developments. And I, I wonder, yeah, so it seems to curate for people who have less time, people who are, who are working, but who have means to purchase those games. But at the same time, I'm wondering, yeah, what about younger people with more time? Are they, are they still playing? Uh, as invested campaign as we are because it's also funny that the, I've been doing a panel about TikTok recently but except TikTok there's no there's not that much communication outside from younger players about what they're doing and what what they enjoy it's it's difficult mm -hmm. to have a read of what the younger community is like uh, especially in the UK because clubs are in pubs and bars so younger players can, uh, cannot be around so yeah. I have really no clue what younger players are, are playing beside D&D 5th edition and beside the, the critical role community uh, uh, <clears throat> so my son Austin uh, what was it was he in 5th I don't know if maybe I can't remember if he was in fifth grade, but he asked for his birthday if I would run Dungeons and Dragons for him and his friends. And he started running D and D after that, uh, and he stayed gaming up till today. He actually designs games uh, now, and um, you now he's I see him. They engage in several different types of play. He has a core group of friends he's been gaming with for several years. And they have uh, <clears throat> an ongoing 13th age campaign that they've been playing for quite a while. Nice. They play D and D occasionally. Uh, uh, oh crud! And like they're doing some Lancer right now, uh, which that Kickstarter, the hardback, should be shipping out pretty soon. Is that a mecha uh, role playing game? Yeah. Cool. That's it exactly. Yep. Uh, it, we played a, a demo of that at Gen Con, I think it was last year, maybe it was two years ago, uh, and it definitely of the mech combat type games I played on a tabletop, uh, the mechanics and stuff in there really emulate that mech warrior type feel, uh, and what he's, what we were both really interested in is, okay, that part is great, great mechanics, it does have crunch. Uh, but then what about the pilots and the operatives when they're out of that gear and they're back and they have to repair their stuff and they have to get fun, they have to infiltrate. And that's the sort of things they've been playing through their missions and it's like, oh, hey, we basically got betrayed and dropped into this hostile situation as a sacrifice to stir up, you know, and uh, they do like real short, arcs and a lot of games 
like that. Um, and they do a lot of one hitters too. They just like they tell a short story amongst themselves essentially, and then pick something up. And part of it is they're they're a really smart group of people, um, very diverse, and um, they're hungry to try and do new things by and large in that group. Now, that's a like a tiny little slice. I I don't know what it's like across other uh, younger people. When I'm at conventions, uh, often I, I find that the younger people are much more fun to play with than the older people. <laughs> and I'm an old person. I mean, I'm 56. Uh, but they're generally much more flexible and rolling with things, it seems like. Or maybe it's they're not coming in front-loaded with so many expectations uh, when you're playing something that you haven't played before. And just go with it. Um, so I, I can't speak broadly. I didn't realize that TikTok had a like a gaming subset in it. So uh, yeah, you it's shoot me your TikTok handle so I can follow you to find out what's going on over there. Because I, I TikTok is very entertaining, uh, but I don't generate content on that platform. I just consume it. Yeah, it's 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 weird because since uh, I did the panel about TikTok with four uh, very talented TikTokers uh, who are much younger than I am, they I, I've I've moved away from TikTok almost completely. I stopped consuming yeah. it, uh, so it was yeah. I, it feels like a lifetime ago because it was at the uh, beginning of the lockdown. So at the beginning of the lockdown, I did a lot of yeah. TikToks. Uh, they uh, urge to do those small videos and I started dressing up for them. Ah, you know, oh, I wow. made, I did everything short of doing a TikTok dance, but uh, <laughs> otherwise uh, <laughs> I, 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 I did the, the, the cringiest things you, you can imagine. Uh, yeah, stuff like uh, yeah, yeah, doing pose uh, on the soundtrack, the, the opening theme of uh, Full House. To introduce different yeah. characters, uh, different jokes, and uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating platform. And what's fascinating, I find, is that it's difficult to get on it. In the first time I got on it, it's it's really uh, you got this overload, and you I felt really really old getting on board of that. <laughs> and and yeah. because the humor is based, or even your understanding of whatever is posted, it's mainly based on repetition. It it takes you I don't know a week or so before you you actually understand what is it what it is about, and and once you do it's difficult to explain to people around you. But, yes. But at the same time, uh, it's a feature. I find it's really a feature. The fact that it's kind of hermetical. I don't know if it's the right word in English. It's it's. Uh, it's difficult to get on board, but it's a feature almost because what the community there, uh, it's it's intimate in a way. People say very personal and embarrassing things mm -hmm. on TikTok, and although it's completely public, but because you cannot Google it and because it's kind of difficult to find specific content to Google, find a person. Uh, a lot of people like uh, I'm 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 uh, I am uh, what's the word I am binary I'm I'm, I'm not uh, I'm a boring uh, bearded cisset uh, white man, but there's a lot of non-binary people who come out mm -hmm. in their videos on TikTok, and it's kind of a running gag that their family don't know about that, but they can do it yeah. on this public forum because. I guess I guess it's like going to a convention in a sense. It's a public forum, but the people within the convention are rather specific. The the, the chances of uh, running into uh, I don't know your your grumpy uncle are extremely limited <laughs> yes. in the in the middle <laughs> of this. Uh, it's a feature. It's a feature, so it's. Yep. I encourage people who are curious about it to check it out. And the the thing I recommend to people is as soon as you get there. Pick a few hashtags you like and put them as your favorites because it's going to really curate ah. the content to what you do. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of stuff which are, are just not relevant to you. And with that said, the, the platform, I haven't been there uh, very recently. I just had a look this morning. Um, 
it's increasingly political why it was not before yeah. on one hand it's a good thing uh, because obviously uh, voices regarding what's going on at the moment it's very important to broadcast them but with that comes also the opposite fringe of the political spectrum which is uh, depressing and uh, yeah and yeah. Fuck, fuck them uh, <laughs> fuck Nazi yeah, no. so so the more of that thing it used to be a, a place where uh this kind of debate for better or worse was sort of out so it could be a comfort place now it's it's not as much a, a comfortable and uh uh place where you can forget about your your daily life as as it was before right yeah for me tiktok was it was pure entertainment uh well 90% pure entertainment uh i watch a lot of powwow and uh uh bell dancing and stuff by Native Americans on it. So that has definitely a social aspect because, uh, but a lot of it was for fun. And I haven't been on it for two weeks now. So I bet that it, I would, it's going to be a very different experience next time I open it and go through it. Uh, I mean, my Twitter, I thought it was dark already when the coronavirus crisis started and it's gone so dark now uh and i still i need to get better control and stop scrolling doom scrolling as they call it over there because it just boy does it negatively affect my mood but then i feel guilty when i escape into a book i'm like uh, so i don't know it's a difficult time to be alive so going back on on more positive things, what what you're telling me about uh, the games your your son is playing? It, it's it's a mm -hmm. it's a son, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Austin's my son. Uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a father of a two years old, so I've got a few years ahead of me, and yeah. uh, on one hand, I don't want to force things upon him although i do wake him up playing learning the ukulele uh, it seems to be working but uh, oh, cool. either he will have nightmares about it or he will be a, a, a amazing <laughs> virtuoso but uh, uh, you know i keep wondering uh and that's something i already discussed with senda when he was i don't know less than one year old uh, we did an episode about the never-ending story uh but i keep wondering okay do i want to introduce him to role playing game or do you I want him to come to me and ask for role playing game what what what's appropriate oh or did you pull it off did did your did Austin came to you I want to play role playing games or I think you already said that uh or did yeah, you expose him to me and uh, among friends I've typically found that you kind of start off with their kids board gaming and then you know, it's just like real life, you know, you model the behavior you'd like to see your kids emulate, you know, being a responsible person, being a caring person, you know, doing the right thing. Well, they also watch you, what games you play and the pleasure that you get out of that, the people that you play with and the positive interactions there. I think that modeling that behavior uh, tends to lead that way. I mean, but, you know, people are have really different drives for what makes them happy and i've got a good friend and he would just he would love his son to get into role playing <laughs> games but his son would much rather you know play xbox or play a board game than to role play and that's okay that's and, not my nightmare my nat nightmare yeah. is soccer practice or rugby that would be even worse <laughs> for me. I'd be like, no, no, please. I mean, if he wants, he wants, but uh, yep. uh, yeah, I, I would be miserable to be sitting on the side of a, a football pitch and uh, and uh, thank God there's no yeah. American football here in the in the UK, so it's well, oh, there's a man, bit, but it's yeah. unlikely. But uh, yeah, if he was a sport fan, and uh, I mean, if he if, if cars fans, sports fans, so. Uh, you know, there's a thing you 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 try to do the things you want them to emulate, but I also think there's probably a part of my parents are not doing that. Oh, I'm afraid of that. The, that my parents are doing that, so hence it's not cool. There's this thing my parents are not doing. Hence, it <laughs> yeah, is very cool. Differentiation, <laughs> right? It's like when 
when you get those teen years and you start setting yourself apart from your family, <laughs> that you do get those behaviors that are pushbacks against it. Yeah, it's interesting. I, my dad's a minister, uh, and so I was playing D and D during the height of the satanic panic, and I was talking with my folks about this not too long ago, and they're like. It was very clear you guys weren't casting any spells or talking about Satan, so we just <laughs> thought it was nuts. <laughs> um, so, we, we've got, yeah, I mean... We've got Sardonicus in the, the chat room. Uh, thanks for joining us, Sardonicus. Oh. Who's telling us... Hey, Sardonicus. He's telling us that his 18 years old daughter is crazy on Pathfinder, and I've yet to swear he has yet to swear her into Call of Cthulhu. Pathfinder, ah. wow, that's uh, that's oh. hardcore. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I played Pathfinder for quite a while until Fifth Edition D and D came out. Actually, so good on you and her. So sorry, you were saying. I don't remember what I was talking <laughs> about. I'm really bad about stream of consciousness. It just gone. Ah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. It's. Uh, Raising a child, that's something. Uh, the moment is, I was telling my wife yesterday, okay, so far we, I guess it, it was still in a uh, instinct mode, you know, mainly uh, what he enjoys, what he doesn't. And I, I yeah. think now is is getting into a stage where it's more, there's more psychology coming. So Yeah, he, personalities got, manifesting, yeah. becoming more defined. So there, there's more mood swings and stuff. And uh, of course, he's been locked with us. Uh, we, we go out to the park and so on, but he hasn't been interacting with other children. He hasn't been to the nursery for several months now. And it's interesting oh, how... Yeah. It's interesting he started... Uh, so we watch a lot of streaming uh, on Netflix and uh, there's a mm -hmm. few shows he was obsessed with and at the beginning of the lockdown it was like the same show and me and then it would move to another one but like all the time the same one but yeah okay so it was yeah. Hey Duggy which is a, a British thing for, for children then it was Shown the Sheep which is a uh, stop motion with a little sheep in clay oh. mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and now he's in a mode when he's He's getting fed up. He's, he's got the capacity of getting fed up of something. And so oh. <laughs> when he asks for the television, we're on something. And you're like, okay, do you want to watch that? Now. And then, so you want to watch a Dougie? Now. And you, you switch to the other one. And if you want this one then? Now. And he does what we do in the evening on Netflix. You know, when you browse everything. Else. So what are we watching tonight? Yeah. This movie? Oh, I don't feel in the mood for a horror movie tonight. This yeah. one, no, it's a good movie, but it's too close to, to the news. This one then, oh, I'd, I'd love rather see something I haven't seen yet. And you bros, you bros, and he's like that now. Yeah. You, we bros, we bros, what, what do you actually want to do? And he's like, I don't know, man. I just put on something. Yeah. But I'm very happy he's into uh, Ghibli Studio movies. I'm oh, those very are so great. Yeah, I'm so blessed with that. I'm like, wow, that, yeah. that's something so good. So he's been watching Totoro, Kiki Delivery Service, uh, and Poco Rosso that. in circle. That's probably my favorite Ghibli. So. Which one? Uh, my Neighbor Totoro. Yeah, it's... I just adore that. It's so good, and it's, it's really weird when you show it at the to a very young child how he was mesmerized by scenes even scenes which are not you know with fantastical things and on the other end not, that he wasn't it's interesting what he's scared of, of and not scared of so like Totoro uh, yep. the introduction scene with Mei he's got this big mouth and it's it's a big gigantic monster when you think about it yeah. uh, he wasn't scared about that and then you got the scene at the beginning of Spirited Away which he, he doesn't he still doesn't like Spirited Away the scene of the beginning when the parents are moving into the tunnel with the, their daughter and she's like, no, I don't want to go there and so on. And th there's nothing visually, you know, impressive or graphic, but I don't know if it's the music, the mood, but it's very mm -hmm. impressive. Oh, the first time he saw that, although he was very young and, you know, you're not quite sure how much he can process, he was scared by that. You could see, if he could really feel the tension of the, the medium yep. and it's, it's very really impressive in terms of storytelling to, to see, wow, this thing manages to communicate an emotion 
to a very young child without without a big scary thing with with teeth. Huh? Yep. Yeah, uh, and I think that's really interesting too. Is that show us how geared towards stories humans are. We want to consume stories, tell stories, share stories, and you know that's one of the things that you know I'm trying to be better about is listening to stories from people who are very different from me. Uh, as long as they're not fascist, I have no need to waste time on them. But um, yeah, from a really young age, I mean, I, I read the Lord of the Rings trilogy to my daughter. Oh my God, I don't think Liz was, maybe she was seven years old. She might not have even been that old. And she made me read the whole flipping thing. We started with The Hobbit and went all the way through Return of the King. That was a lot of evenings of reading. And then like we did the Harry Potter books and that every year. Um, in fact, one time we were out camping when one of the books came out and I drove home to get the book that was delivered by Amazon and took it back out to the campsite so we could read Harry Potter at night that, that evening. So, uh, but that drive to consume stories uh, and to tell them is uh, really one of the wonderful things that I, I enjoy so much. And that's why I like books and that's also why I can really appreciate but role-playing games uh, offer to people uh, that you get to basically author your own story uh, in collaboration with people. And, you know, I've been very lucky to self-select into groups that are great at collaborative story playing. Like, and that's where the gauntlet really shines. Um, I played there with people and it was back when you could use uh, Google Hangouts and we'd have in our sidebar chat, you know, if someone would be playing something, we'd be like, do you want me to push this, you know, agenda here? And we'd be very clear about what we were driving towards characters and emotionally for the characters. And that level of play, I cannot even begin to tell you what a rush it is to have people help you tell your story or to put a spin there that you never would have thought of and to riff off of that is like one of the biggest adrenaline endorphin rushes I've ever had has been gaming with those people, uh, especially the Mercy Fall series that I did uh, with them. It's just great storytelling and uh, Deft Hand by Jason Cordova, who was our MC for that Monster Heart series and just beautiful gameplay by people, just wow. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it again. It's just an absolutely amazing gameplay. That's a, there are some games which are like that. I think the tabletop role playing's got it's, it's a very uh, I, I guess the, the the closest thing to that for me is is theater, uh, both in the mm -hmm. audience mm -hmm. or on stage. But th there's really something. It's not happening all the time, and I'm sure there are there even. And, um, it's not exactly a criticism. It's a, it's a pity, but I'm sure that there are people that can play role playing games all their life and they, they never quite get it because that's now how they play the game, or it's not uh, they're not lucky to play with with people yeah. who, who bring you to this point, which which is which is it's not just a positive. It's, it's something very vulnerable. You know, it's it's why you know safety yeah. practices are good because you put yourself in this yes. spot and you you really expose yourself. So on one hand, it's it's magical. On the other hand, it's yeah, you you're really exposing your your, your feelings to to other people. But uh, when you when you get there, when you 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 manage to forget yourself and you're in this character and you're having these emotions, uh, yeah, that's the, really the the magic of tables of role playing and and. I really miss the the immersion of reading. That's something I, I cannot do it anymore. I, I've tried it on a couple of times, or when I was on holiday and so on, to get back at reading, and I never quite managed to lose myself in a book like I used to when I was mm. a, a teenager yeah. or even twenty something. I read The Lord of the Rings rather late. I was probably twenty one or twenty two, but completely lost myself in it when I when I read it. Yeah. But uh, or stuff like I remember going to to Spain with my uh, with my mother. It was with her classroom because she was a teacher, so I was not 
part mm. of a student, mm -hmm. but uh, we would take a coach from Belgium. And uh, I think in five days, I read the whole Stephen King, The Stand, which are rather oh, yeah. thick book. And yep. uh, and rather topical with uh, well not exactly topical but yeah it's about a pandemic relevant uh, yeah <laughs> and and there's there's quite a bit of racism in there but yeah I I I just read full time full time next to the swimming pool on the beach uh, in the bedroom uh, each time I would have a moment I would just read it as a teenager who yep. was gloomy and closed on himself so it was not entirely positive but at the same time. Yeah, you you go there and you you got these experiences. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the gauntlet. Uh, I want to engage with the the community, but I'm a bit shy because uh, I I've got uh, what's the word? Uh, I'm I've got self interest in doing that because I want to go there and uh, tell about my game that I'm developing. Uh, so they're so supportive. You you shouldn't be afraid. Uh, it's. Uh, they are very good at self-policing. They are positive people, but if you have a game project you're working on, that's a place where you can go and get useful feedback, uh, people who are happy to play test and give honest opinions. Um, I, I can't uh, recommend the gauntlet highly enough. It's really worth, you know, get out there and just lurk for a while and watch the way people interact. Uh, or watch some of their videos of them in gameplay. Uh, uh, it's uh, a very, very positive, diverse community, uh, and um, they are excited to try new things. I mean, like the whole trophy RPG is really an impressive, uh, almost piece of art, honestly. Uh, that Jesse Ross and other members of the gauntlet have put together and the way that uh, community has uh, provided incursions and stuff for it. It's just absolutely uh, amazing. And, you know, I don't know, are you a member currently of the gauntlet or not? Uh, no, um, yet, but to be honest, I know of the gauntlet. I've heard of the gauntlet. Yeah. My assumption is that it's a community slash forum mostly. Uh, so. I don't know what what it is actually. Is there a membership? Is it is it mainly the forum? Is it a Discord now? Because yeah, you know, uh, technology. Uh, moves so, on. Uh, for doing online gaming, so they have open calendar gaming. They use Firebase uh, calendaring to schedule games, and anyone can play. But they open up the calendar first to people who are Patreon members of the group. And that covers their expenses. They do a monthly uh, magazine uh, called The Codex that has original games, uh, scenarios, ideas, uh, original art in it that's super good. And the monthly codexes, uh, often you can get a free download of them. Uh, and there's some great stuff in there. And then they do have a forum uh, that they run, and that's got you know boards for game development for people looking for games. Uh, they run one to two online cons every year. I was did the last one. Was it in? I can't remember if it was in November or October. And I played like five games over two days. And honestly, in some ways, it was better than actually being at a convention. Because I didn't have to spend over a thousand dollars in travel and hotel fees to play a bunch of great games with great people, uh, and they have gaming going on all the time online, and all sorts of games. Uh, I, I, I really do recommend uh, checking them out. I would check them out, and also I, I'm about to to expose myself to quite a, a few things because. Uh, today, I, I believe they, they start being uh, public and people can have a look at them. I, I submitted several games, 11 sessions of my games for Origins Online. So I'm going to start trying to, to have oh, players yeah. join them. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> first of all, that's that's a lot. And i never done that, so I'm curious to see how it goes. We were talking about children uh, in the settings. It was asking me, so oh, young, can you play, can you be to play that game? And I was like... Uh, yeah. Uh, there's a bit of mass, but you know, uh, as long as uh, 
players behave and I will be there to look for uh, uh, out for that. Uh, I I was like 10 plus. So I put 10 plus thinking maybe if there's a father or a mother, they, they want to bring their, their children along. And then yeah. I'm like, you know, there's nothing which prevents me to end up with three, four, <laughs> 10 plus children uh, at the table. So I'm a bit, yeah, yeah I'm a bit like, yeah, we, we, we'll see how, how that goes. Uh, well, I hope. So, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I've been podcasting for a while. I've been interacting, engaging as much as I can with the community, but it's mostly with London and Europe. So, so first of all, as a game designer, you interact with people very differently with other game designers and so on. And, and mm -hmm. second, uh, yeah, no, it, with this bit Cafe Rodist, uh since I'm doing it online now, I started interviewing people like you in the US, and it's uh, it's quite interesting uh, because again, you and uh, a bunch of other people, I've been interacting lightly online, but we we never had a conversation. So so yeah, it's 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 quite fascinating, and I I keep wondering. Uh, when you put aside all the obviously negative things uh, associated with which are a direct result of the the current pandemic i'm very curious about the long term impact it will have on on the tabletop roping community because i think it yeah. it brought us together a lot of a lot of people it, it even brought people together within single countries i've seen that with an online convention in france uh it was mm. crazy to see yeah. people interacting people were spread across different regions of France and they, they might not be as apart from being uh, in New York or Minnesota versus California, but still yeah. uh, because perception of scale, uh, yeah, people did, did not interact so much. So, so yeah. Have you, have you engaged with people online? You, uh, beside me. Yeah. The gauntlet, <laughs> the gauntlet is uh, almost exclusively an online gaming community. They've got a, fabulous set of tools to facilitate online games um, and with gauntlet i've played with people from germany uh, london wales uh, australia um, south america a lot of us some canada uh, so it's been um, geographically diverse uh, i've gotten up at like five in the morning to play games online with people over in Australia. So it's uh, been pretty cool. Amazing. On that, you were warning me about uh, an appointment you were having this afternoon and the need to finish yeah, early. I should have a technician I, coming on site I, here. I should so. have stopped also to wake up my son, but I just got a, <laughs> a grocery store delivery banging on my doors now from Sainsbury. Right. So I will be the one actually cutting us short. Uh, thank you so <laughs> much, Kevin. It's been a pleasure yeah, it was a, having it you. It was a great conversation. I really and, uh, enjoyed it. I wish I wish I could I was able to uh, to follow streams by uh, misdirected Mark more more often. It's one in the morning uh, here, but yeah. Oh uh, uh, yeah. Where can people <laughs> find you if you wish to be found? And uh, yeah, that's uh, please say your final goodbye to uh, our modest yep, audience. Uh, yeah, I'm at Kev Thuhu out on. Twitter, and that is pretty much the only place you're going to find me because I'm anti Facebook. And get out there and dismantle patriarchy and systems of oppression. Peace. Peace. Amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, speaking of that, uh, I will ask you on Twitter feel free to, to give me links to uh, the um, uh, influencer. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure the right term, but the, the people you recommended to, to follow, and I will put them in the description yep. of this episode. I really right, need to run. Get it over. Thank you so much. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye. -bye. Bye.